When I began to work on this topic once again, after half an hour checking some points in Keynes and Whittingham books, it was already clear that three texts are, are at the climax of variation. The Ainu Lindale, the text about Galadriel on chapter 22 of the Silmarillion. So that's the goal, how to explain their variance. Is it possible to work? It is possible to work on the details of each text, but in 20 minutes, it is impossible to reach a clear view. In the other hand, when making some reflection on how to sort the basis to explain what the Silmarillion, what the Silmarillion is to someone having only a few ideas about it, I realized that a few bases help to see that there is a kind of combinatory of the criteria of the variance for the three main problematical texts. So, let's see the basis for such goals. The sentence of Hippocrates, translated by, translated by Chaucer, is well known, and Tolkien quoted it, the life so short to craft, so long to learn. We can coin a kind of pastiche. Tolkien published so little, so many texts to Nigo. There was for long something like a rule in the Republic of Letters that a definitive edition is the last one published when the author was alive. One speaks of the dogma of the author last will in authorial philology. There are such editions for The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. But what about such a project as the Silmarillion? As Randall Helms put it as early in 1981, first quotation in the handbook, on that, when, as happened with the Silmarillion, a writer dies before finishing his work, his work and leaves more than one version of some of its parts, which then find publication elsewhere, which version will the critic approach as the real story? After the publication of the 12 volumes of the history of Middle-earth, we know that it is quite infantile to think that the Silmarillion could have been composed with the last version of every text. How then to read all these texts? An ideological reading can find arguments in some variants and versions, and another one would choose others. How to remain ethically and scholarly unstained? Is there even a definitive choice to make? How to find one's way in the Silmarillion as a corpus? Does any text have the same importance as another. How to quote such text in the scholarship? Three, set, three sets of remarks could be helpful, part one. What about the question of the canonicity of the text in the history of Middle-earth? What about ordering the use of the variants? And what about Tolkien's incentives for writing? A few comments about each of these questions would lead us to understand, second part, the complexity of the authorial status the Silmarillion leaves to the scholars. In praise of the variant, first we have to make clear what the so-called question of canonicity in the Tolkien studies is. Are the text of the history of Middle-earth canonical? This way of speaking leads to consider that maybe some are apocryphal. But is apocryphal what has a suspect authenticity? And the texts published in the history of Middle-earth do have as their authentic author G. A. R. Tolkien. One thing is to consider that the Silmarillion, published in 1977 by Christopher Tolkien, is somewhat apocryphal, and Christopher goes as far as saying that, second quotation, 
The book was good, but a little false. Insofar, I have to, I have had to invent some passages. But the text from which he published the Silmarillion can't be considered as apocryphal. So why are they not spontaneously taken as canonical? They are more or less contradictory, the ones to the others. Some are contradictory with the published text too. They differ in the stories told. They sometimes differ in the conceptions of Middle Earth itself, in, his, in its philosophical and theological implications. How can we put in order how relation to these texts our views of them? How to go further in Middle Earth with such texts? The question is how to take into account the variants in Tolkien studies. That's the appraisal of the Silmarillion as a project and related to the book of 1977 that is at stake. There are at least two ways in ordering, from an Archimedean point and as a network, uh, that is, an internal web. The Archimedean method is the easy one. From this point of view, the history of Middle Earth is related to the Silmarillion, the book. That's the way that that's the way that almost everyone uses for a first learning, for going after thirdly into Middle Earth. Christopher Tolkien himself acts as if the Silmarillion, the book, was a fixed point of reference as soon as the unfinished tales. But there is a bias. The book of 1977 is only a first glimpse published by Christopher Tolkien. The Archimedean point is not as absolute as we would like it to be. Is it so sure that Tolkien concludes that all would be coherent, that it contains only narratives? The network method is more difficult and must take into account that the Silmarillion isn't a fixed design, but a living creation. In that case, all the texts are relative, not any one of them is absolute. There is, a third, there is a third way, considering that the last written text by Tolkien would represent his definitive view. Difficulties are great. Firstly, there is the problem of its dating. Often, Tolkien didn't give any date in his draft or fair copies, and we are content with internal or, exter or, or external evidences. So what is the last text from the point of view of dating? Secondly, in some cases, Tolkien changed his mind after he had writing several versions for decades. What is then the last thing? Is it the last written text? or the last expressed intention, even if the narratives haven't been revised. Thirdly, in his last will, J. R. Tolkien explicitly gives his son Christopher, question number three, full power to publish, edit, alter, rewrite, or complete any work which may be unpublished at my death. All the alterations made after his death are therefore authenticated. But because Christopher said that all that his father wrote was canonical for him, we are back to the first issue of canonicity. Tolkien authenticates the future Silmarillion. Christopher canonis canonizes all the Silmarillion. What a cycle. At last, we must, we must keep in mind that Tolkien had at least three incentives for writing. I call incentive what is more than a reason, rather an appeal to write. Let's 
Now name each incentive and justify it by quotation. The ling linguistical incentive comes from language and goes to the stories. I quote, number four, the invention of languages is the foundation. The stories were made rather to provide a world for the languages than the reverse. To me, a name comes first and the story follows. The legendarium incentive comes from the legends and goes to the country or religion. I quote number five and, and six. I had a mind to make a body of more or less connected legend which I could dedicate simply to, to Hingler. This patriotic goal grounded in the matter of the North went to be abandoned and the legends fail, theologically recast in being accepted by a man by a man that believes in the blessed trinity the explanation incentive the third one the explanation incentive goes explicitly back from the legends to philosophy and theology christopher said number seven as his life went on the mythology and poetry of my father's work sunk down behind the philosophy and theology in it. Much of his thought in his last 10 years was devoted to explaining things in, in, in his own work. Well, with these remarks about canonicity, about the Archimedean point or not, and about the three writing incentives, we, are now, we have now the tools to understand the complexity of the reading and the use of the text G.A.R. Tolkien never published. Second part. Why are there so many variants? Because Tolkien changed his mind and started over again and again almost all of his legends and related texts. It is well known that he is Nigel. That was the question why. There is also the question how. How did he change his versions? Let's have a look at, at that with the three paradigmatic examples that are the Heino Lindale opening the Silmarillion, but not the book of Lost Tales, and which is outside the Quenta Silmarillion. The character of Galadriel appearing, of course, in several chapters of the Silmarillion and of the Lord of the Rings, and the chapter 22 of the Silmarillion of the Runes of Doria. The Haino Lindale is a unique case because Tolkien was writing it regularly at the, at the several stages of development of the Silmarillion. It is well known. The motto for the Heino Lindale in Tolkien's writing is again and again. But there is a mythological issue which is less seen. Because the Heino Lindale is a unique case of such a long development, it offers us a wider scope for, from a mythological point of view. Most of the scholars focus on the version C asterisk with the crux of the round earth versus flat earth. But that's only the massive part of the richness of the variants in the Aino Lindale. I suggested to distinguish the questions relative to the origin in the relative to the fundament, so between story or history and philosophy. For all that concerns the origin, we speak in French of the originel, the originaire, and the original, which could be translated in English without the common root as original, subsequent, and unique. Quotation 8. Original is used to designate only what is present from the first version on. 
anything which is introduced at a later stage and remains to the end, it has from version N on, will be called subsequent. Unique designates features which are found only in one version or group of versions. And finally, fundamental is used for anything, anything which conveys an overall concept. No other text that, than the Ainu Lindale lends itself for such a clear inventory. That's a tool for learning how to read Tolkien. Let's look at Galadriel. About this character I call New Initiative, what Christopher described as unfulfilled intention. The case of, the case of Galadriel is indeed singular. As Christopher said, a history, a history of Galadriel can only be a history of my father's changing conceptions. And Tolkien changed it just before he died. The motto about Galadriel in, Tol in Tolkien's writings could be once anew at the end. It is clear that Galadriel was on his mind repeatedly in 1973. In August, he wrote to Anthony Gifford that Galadriel was unstained. She had committed no evil deeds, making her even closer to the Virgin Mary as previously. He did have detailed some consequences during the same weeks in a partly illegible note for which Christopher himself can only edit a summary. Christopher comments, number nine, this story is profoundly at variance with all that is said elsewhere. It arose from philosophical rather than historical considerations. That is, that it would have entailed a good deal of alteration in the narrative of the Silmarillion is evident, but that my father Duplass intended to do we see here a change from a new fundament, as for the Ainu Lindale, and it comes from the explanation incentive, having a philosophical or theological reason, but without effect on the narratives due to the death of Tolkien. What would have been the effect on the, of the Love of the Rings? Is it so sure that it was the Silmarillion, Silmarillion which had to be harmonized everywhere with the Lord of the Rings. Think about it. Let's be shorter about of the Round of Doriath. This story is only told fully in the book of Lost Tales, 1917. And the last completed version is from the Quenta Noldo Ruina, uh, 1930. Tolkien never expressed intention to rewrite it. The motto for this chapter 22 in Tolkien's writing could be never again. But therefore Christopher had to work a lot on it. He said that for the alter he said that for the alteration GK took a major part and Christopher expressed regrets for what had been done. The conduct of Thingol was wholly at variance with the later conception of the king, because it was incompatible with the latter works Christopher cho chose to invent even if there is no authority whatever in my father's writings. There is more, because in opposite ways Christopher omitted what had actually been written by his father he qualified afterwards this omission as an excessive tampering with my father's actual thought and intention. How heavy Christopher alterations are, we are here at the level of radical changes in the narrative, in the story, not at the philosophical nor theological level. Let's conclude. From the wall frame we just sketched, we can collect some conclusion. There is a table at the bottom of the handout. The, the Aino Lindale varies 
and is reworked fundamentally from the explanation incentive point of view. All the variations concerning the origin, subsequent and unique belong to the Silmarillion as a corpus without an Archimedean point. Tolkien took time to rewrite it. Written texts do exist. About Galadriel, the final alteration is understandable only from the explanation incentive too. Tolkien expressed a last intention, a last intention, even if there is no narrative newly produced. He had no time to do so. About of the reign of Doriath, we are at the level of the legendarium incentive. Tolkien didn't leave a last intention. There is no cohesive narrative with the corpus, even if he had time to do so. Finally, what about the authorial status? We can rely on two articles published in the, 19, in the 1920s by Marie-Dominique Chenu. Tolkien is what the Romans called an, in Latin, an auctor for the Silmarillion as a corpus. The sense of the word auctor in classical Latin was who takes the initiative and has the right to transmit something to someone else. It was like this that Tolkien was the author of the Silmarillion. And Christopher is the auctor of the Silmarillion, the book, in the medieval sense of the word, who has received authority to solve a question and interprets the auctoritas in an expositio reverentulis, with respect. These, they are both auctores, but in different ways, and the cycle of the cycle of the canonicity is hence enlightened. Tolkien took the initiative, Christopher had de jure authority for publishing the book. Thank you for your attention.